So today we're going to talk about how allosteric regulation can affect enzyme kinetics. But first, let's review the idea that an enzyme's catalysis can be divided into two steps. First, the binding of enzymes to substrate, and second, the formation of products. And using this information, we can derive the Michaelis-Menten equation, which allows us to look at an enzyme's rate of product formation with respect to substrate concentration. Also remember that substrates will typically bind to enzymes at the active site. So what do we mean when we say allosteric regulation? Well, we know that enzymes usually have an active site where substrates can bind, but enzymes can also have what we call an allosteric site. And these allosteric sites are places on the enzyme where any enzyme regulator can bind. And I've put this star here just to point out that allosteric sites can be anywhere on an enzyme, and there can be any number of them as well. So what do we mean when we say regulators? Well, we generally say that there are two types of regulators. There are allosteric activators, which increase enzymatic activity and activate them, and allosteric inhibitors, which decrease enzymatic activity and inhibit the enzymes. So let's take a look at what we mean by increasing and decreasing enzymatic activity from a kinetic perspective. So remember the Michaelis-Menten equation, and if we're assuming substrate concentration to be constant, then there are two ways to influence enzymatic activity, or VO. And in this first graph, I've drawn three different curves, and the blue curve represents the enzyme functioning without an allosteric regulator at all. The red curve represents an enzyme with an allosteric inhibitor, and the green curve represents the enzyme with an allosteric activator. And in this example, the activators and inhibitors affect VO through either increasing or decreasing Km, since the Vmax values seem to be pretty close between the three curves. So an activator here might be decreasing Km. Now in this next example, we have the same three colored curves, but instead of Km changing significantly, the regulators seem to be changing Vmax, with the activator increasing the Vmax value. So now that we've talked about activators and inhibitors, let's introduce the idea of the feedback loop. And the basic idea is that a feedback loop is when you have downstream products regulating upstream reactions. And I understand this can be a mouthful, so let me show you this little reaction sequence where we have A forming B through reaction 1, and B forming C through reaction 2, and so on and so on. Now let's say that molecule F acted as an activator for the enzyme powering reaction 1. So it had a positive effect on enzyme 1's activity. Now we would call this a positive feedback loop since molecule F increases the rate of reaction 1, which then causes even more F to be made since we increase the rate of formation of molecule F. Now let's say molecule F had a negative effect on enzyme 1, we would call this a negative feedback loop, since molecule F decreases the rate of reaction 1, which leads to a decrease in the rate of formation of molecule F. So let's look at an example of a feedback loop, just to really drive home the point if you're still confused. Now phosphofructokinase is an enzyme involved in glycolysis, and it catalyzes the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate and ATP to form fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and ADP. Now remember that glycolysis is a metabolic process that cells use to generate ATP. So here our molecule F, or downstream regulator from the last example, is ATP. And it turns out that ATP is an allosteric inhibitor of phosphofructokinase. And this makes sense because if ATP is at a high level, then it's like the cell saying, we have ATP and we don't really need any more. And we don't need phosphofructokinase to push glycolysis along. So this would be a good example of a negative feedback loop, since making ATP slows down glycolysis and thus slows down the rate of ATP production. Now, because ATP is both an allosteric regulator and a substrate for phosphofructokinase, we can call it a homotropic inhibitor, which is a new term. And we call it a homotropic inhibitor because the substrate and the regulator are the same molecule. Now, AMP, which is used up ATP, is an activator for phosphofructokinase, and this also makes sense because if AMP levels are high, then ATP levels are probably low, and it's like the cell saying, we need ATP, so we do need phosphofructokinase to push glycolysis along. Now, since AMP is a regulating molecule but not an active site substrate for phosphofructokinase, it would be considered a heterotropic activator, since the substrate and regulator are different.
Now, the final point I want to make is that specific reactions make excellent control points for long multi-step processes. And remember that glycolysis is a 10-step sequence. So why is there so much regulation going on for this one step? Well, this reaction in particular has a very negative delta G, and it's actually negative 4.5 kcal per mole. And that means that it's not easily reversed since there will be a big release of energy from the reaction, and this makes this step of glycolysis an excellent control point for all 10 steps together since it's more or less a one-way reaction. So what did we learn? Well, first we learned about the concept of allosteric and how regulatory molecules can bind to allosteric sites instead of active sites. Second, we learned that these allosteric regulators influence an enzyme's kinetics by increasing or decreasing Km or Vmax. And third, we learned about what a feedback loop is and how in long, multi-step processes like glycolysis, the best control points are highly committing steps, the ones with very negative delta G values.